Hello everyone, and welcome to the 74th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Gordon Gecko from the Wall Street series. The embodiment of the greed that surrounds Wall Street, Gordon serves as the personification of everything wrong with the stock market and those who manipulate it. A glorified con man clawing his way to the top through manipulation, espionage, and deception. In this video, we're going to be looking at Gordon as he appears in the two films in this series, but this analysis of Gordon's character can also be applied to many other individuals throughout the history of Wall Street and the present day. As the shady practices of old never really died, the people engaging in them just got better at hiding it. But before we begin, let's first talk about our sponsor for this video, Likewise. Likewise is a free app that you can use to discover new shows, films, books, and podcasts from any genre you can think of. I often find myself scrolling endlessly through streaming apps, book retailers, and podcast platforms for things that are suited to my tastes. And if you add in the countless hours of watching through something that you hope against all odds will get better, you have a recipe for a very unsatisfying experience. Likewise is the perfect solution to this problem. First, you start off by selecting some of your favorite genres in each category, then some of your favorite titles from those genres. Likewise then generates a list of choices for you to choose from based on your selections. Likewise then generates a list of new material for you to choose from based on your selections, a list that gets updated each day to keep things fresh. The best part for me though is the community tab. Here, people can make specific lists and write reviews on each title. For example, I love horror films, but there are some real stinkers out there that I regret giving even a minute of my time to. And with Likewise, you can eliminate that by getting both a detailed description of each title you find, as well as feedback from other viewers, readers, or listeners. It's a fun way to keep your friends and family engaged in whatever interests you, as you can invite them to join Likewise so you can share and discuss your new discoveries with those close to you. I'm going to be making some lists myself in the near future, and I'd love to get some new recommendations from all of you. So after you download Likewise by using the link in the description, feel free to add me by using the username you're seeing on screen to get in on the fun. Thank you Likewise for sponsoring this video. Now without further ado, let's begin. Before our first encounter with Gordon in the film, He's spoken of at Bud Fox's brokerage as an almost mythical figure, an unseen god of the Wall Street pantheon whose accomplishments are admired and fawned over as the newspapers report his many achievements on a seemingly daily basis. His elusiveness is even more evident when we find Bud attempting to schedule a meeting with him, something he's ridiculed over for how impossible that proposition seems. This might not seem to be something integral to the deviousness inherent in his character at a glance, but his reputation is an incredibly important component of Gordon's character and his ability to maneuver so well in the cutthroat world of Wall Street. Obviously, he didn't start out with a reputation, but his reputation is an incredibly important component of Gordon's character and his ability to maneuver so well in the cutthroat world of Wall Street. But it's this reputation that draws in impressionable people like Bud Fox, people who bend over backwards at the chance to work with, or for, the great Gordon Gecko. Which is what brings us to our first encounter with Gordon. Standing in an office decorated in a ritzy New Age 80s style, we find Gordon in his element making deals via phone, with cronies and monitors surrounding him updating him on the price action of his holdings and prospects. Wearing well-tailored clothing, a pinky ring, and other gold ornaments on his person, his apparel as well as his slick back hair and laid-back attitude presents us with a man who looks and acts as if he hasn't a care in the world, a man who's charismatic, sure of himself, and at the pinnacle of power in the world he inhabits. Initially, we're made to believe that he's simply a genius, a man who's naturally gifted with the ability to accurately predict the rise and fall of stocks to the point that he's managed to build a financial empire off his talents alone. Gordon is certainly talented in that regard. As a person who achieves any kind of success in any field, has to be at least somewhat proficient in their chosen profession. But we soon find out that whatever talent he has is heavily overshadowed by what really makes Gordon so successful, his talents as a liar and a cheat which is exactly the reason why Gordon is even entertaining Bud in the first place, because he sees some of himself in him, a man with the willingness to do whatever it takes to get ahead. Now, part of the reason that men like Gordon and Bud are drawn to Wall Street is, of course, the allure of becoming extremely rich very quickly. But one of the primary motivators for them to enter into this trade are the experiences they had as a child. Sure, the promise of money is nice, but growing up watching one's working class father struggle and fight for even an acceptable standard of living gives these men the motivation they need to not just fantasize about becoming rich with the power of Wall Street, but to actually do it, which is what brought Gordon to such lofty heights and Bud into his grasp. Now, Bud likely thought that his one-off tip about Blue Star Airlines to Gordon was simply a little push meant to get him into a legitimate position. But unfortunately for Bud, he's encountered one of the hard truths of Wall Street, that being that it's filled with scoundrels and thieves who are willing to do anything to line their own pockets, which Bud finds out only after Gordon has presented him with the honeypot that is the lavish lifestyle that he lives. 
a honeypot filled with lunches at high-profile restaurants where you get seated without reservations, million-dollar checks in the palm of your hand, luxurious country clubs, and limo rides, all of which serve to entice Bud with the life he's always dreamed of living, a desire that ensnares him in the tendrils of Gordon Gecko. All these luxuries were the bait that Gordon needed to hook Bud into becoming a part of his dubious entourage, and to reel him in, he uses one of the most effective tricks straight out of the playbook of manipulation. When Bud shows his reservations about engaging in espionage on behalf of Gordon's interests, by spying on Sir Larry Wildman, another man who's engaged in the same type of reprehensible business practices Gordon engages in, Gordon first relaxes him by providing moral justification for these practices, which in this case, is a long-winded extrapolation of an old adage we're all familiar with. Everyone's doing it, so what's the big deal? When Bud keeps to his stance, Gordon goes on the offensive, challenging Bud to give him a good reason why staying on the straight and narrow will get him anywhere in life, when all around them you can find straight shooters who have nothing more than run-down apartments and a few trinkets to play with when they aren't slaving away for other men. When Bud still shows himself to be hesitant, Gordon switches to the final and most crucial tactic necessary for this form of manipulation to succeed, flattery and an expression of disappointment in the same breath which he does by commenting that Bud had what it took to get into his office, and remarking that the real question now was whether he had what it took to stay there. This is the surface-level charm of Gordon Gecko weaponized to turn ambitious and naive young men into patsies that he can use to further his own interests. That isn't to say that Gordon doesn't legitimately enjoy the company of the men he cultivates as friends, as I'm sure if nothing had gone awry with his relationship with Bud, that they would have remained partners and perhaps even close friends for many years. But Gordon's own ambitions far outweigh any sort of feelings he may have for anyone around him, and the biggest reason for that is because Gordon is a textbook sociopath. We often correlate antisocial personality disorder with violence. As in pop culture, terms like sociopath and psychopath are often attached to characters who commit numerous acts of violence without any sense of remorse. However, antisocial personality disorder, though rare, is not just a disorder that we can attribute to those who engage in physical violence. Rather, there are millions of people who have this disorder across the world who show little to no signs of having it if you aren't looking for it. People you interact with on a daily basis could have it, even members of your own family, and you may never know, as not everyone who has ASPD causes harm to those around them, though it's certainly more likely that they will compared to someone who doesn't. The point I'm trying to make here is that this disorder can't always be recognized through the direct actions of others, but rather through their callous disregard of other people. A good example of this could be you finding out that a friend or family member is indifferent to berating someone for getting their order wrong at a restaurant because they aren't able to empathize with others. In this example, it's not so much the action they're taking that signifies that they have this disorder. It's their lack of remorse for doing so. All of us have bad days and moments of anger and I'm sure almost everyone watching this video has lashed out at another person for one reason or another. The difference between you and someone suffering from this disorder is that you might have felt terrible afterwards and went on to apologize to the person you directed your anger at, whereas someone with ASPD would never experience that feeling or have that thought enter their mind. And though Gordon displays many different symptoms of ASPD, as we've seen so far with his willingness to engage in dishonesty and manipulation with no reservation, it's the slow-building revelation that he feels absolutely no remorse for anything that he does that serves as the most apparent example of this disorder within Gordon, which we can see in the scene where he tells Darian that he doesn't believe in love, but our best example of his lack of empathy is shown to us during his efforts to raid Blue Star Airlines. For those of you who are unaware, Gordon isn't considered just your average stock trader. Rather, he's classified as something called a corporate raider. A corporate raider is, if we go by the definition of Investopedia, an investor who buys a large number of shares in a corporation whose assets appear to be undervalued. The large share purchase would give the corporate raider significant voting rights, which could then be used to push changes in the company's leadership and management. This would increase share value and thus generate a massive return for the raider. To be a corporate raider isn't necessarily a bad thing, as someone investing large amounts of money into a failing company in order to turn it around is fantastic. However, Gordon isn't in the corporation rating business to turn around companies. Gordon is the type of raider who buys a company, artificially raises the price through various nefarious means, and then liquidates the company in order to make himself a large sum of money at the expense of those working at the company, which is exactly what he does with Blue Star. When Bud confronts him about his actions, he explains to Bud that he decided to break up Blue Star because it was breakable, and that nothing is more important than money. Along with his willingness to use impressionable young men to take the windfall for him when he's engaging in nefarious dealings, is what makes Gordon an evil man. 
He takes people's lives into his hand and uses them to create more wealth for himself, no matter what happens to those people once they've outlived their usefulness to him. Using men like Bud Fox is terrible, but at least they're dealing with Gordon of their own free will. But causing thousands of people to lose their jobs without them ever having a say in the matter is abhorrent. And it doesn't just impact them, but their families. And there's no excuse to be made for the amount of hardship these people are forced to endure, so Gordon can have one more yacht or another piece of million dollar artwork. Thankfully, both Bud and Gordon get their comeuppance for their crimes, and Gordon is sentenced to eight years in prison for insider trading and securities. However, when Gordon gets out in 2001, he isn't exactly reformed. Writing a book about his time as a trader and corporate raider, Gordon becomes a motivational speaker, selling his financial wisdom, and judging by the lifestyle he lives once he gets out, it would seem that this is working out quite well for Gordon. But a man like Gordon Gecko is never satisfied with enough. He always wants more. Now, a man who doesn't believe in love will undoubtedly have trouble in maintaining loving relationships, which ends up being the case with the only family he has left, his daughter. Gordon became estranged from his daughter after his son passed due to a drug addiction, an event that Winnie blamed on Gordon due to the fact that he wasn't there to help his son, and all the sordid details about Gordon's decadent life of debauchery didn't help their relationship either. Upon being approached by his daughter's fiance, it appears that Gordon wishes to repair his relationship with his daughter, but she won't allow him into her life out of fear that he'll use her just as he's used so many others. Seemingly turning over a new leaf, we see Gordon attempting to repair his relationship with his daughter, even getting emotional at one point when he expresses to her that she's all he has left, and he just wants to be a father to her. Soon enough though, we find out that Gordon hasn't changed at all, and he shows just how unempathetic and self-centered he can be when he promises to donate money he had stashed away in a Swiss bank account to his soon-to-be son-in-law's pet project, but instead deceives both him and his daughter, taking the money to London and starting a new firm so he can resume doing what he loves best, chasing money for the sake of chasing money. In the end, he has a change of heart, but regardless, his brand of unrelenting ambition caused an unknown and immense amount of misery for thousands of people. However, Gordon is far from being the only, or even the worst offender here. In the first film, we have another example given to us in Sir Larry Wildman, but the unfortunate truth is that Gordon is an amalgamation of several individuals who engaged in this sort of reprehensible behavior in the real world. Men like Ivan Bosky and Michael Milken, involving several crimes related to securities fraud, or Carl Icken, who was a pioneer of corporate raiding. There are others who came after Gordon though, like the infamous Jordan Belfort, and Bernie Madoff, two individuals who made exorbitant amounts of money by exploiting others. And recently, we've seen the ongoing saga playing out between everyday investors and short-sold companies like GameStop and AMC, which shows us that the struggle to eliminate shady practices from the world's markets is far from over. But with any luck, the apes who have banded together will prove to be far stronger than a few skyscraper-sized hedges. Now, possibly the most well-known scene in this film, Gordon's greed is good speech, is incredibly interesting because what he's saying is actually true, but he's putting huge emphasis on the wrong word here. It's not greed that's good, but ambition. Driving yourself to succeed isn't a bad thing at all. Ambition is the drive to improve oneself for the benefit of yourself and those around you. Greed is ambition corrupted into hoarding as much as you possibly can for yourself and possibly others around you at the expense of others. Ambition is what caused the upward mobility of the human race, not greed, as Gordon claims. Greed is the root of countless acts of evil inflicted upon humans by other humans, and it's one of the primary forces that causes misery in our society. Perhaps someday the greedy will get their due, but until then, it surrounds us as an ever-present miasma, choking millions of people across the globe, a tool that Gordon and many other selfish people just like him use as a source for their unrepentant evil. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Gordon and Wall Street? Did I miss anything? And leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured in a future episode while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and Reddit to interact with myself and the community. And follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. And don't forget to add me on Likewise after you download the app by using the link in the description. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.